So today we are going to talk about peace, and then for our exhortation we are going to talk about love. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, there are many other themes that we could put under the heading of developing a biblical worldview. Uh, so these five themes, although they're very important, uh, do not exhaust uh, all of the key themes of the biblical worldview. So right now we will look at peace. Uh, this is the Hebrew word shalom. It occurs 236 times in the Old Testament, and it's usually translated peace, but it's also rendered in other ways, such as health, welfare, and prosperity. Its meaning embraces ideas of wholeness and safety, as well as peace. So it has a, a much more expansive range of meanings than uh, the word peace in English, although peace in English, of course, also has uh, many uses. Uh, the Greek word that's used in the New Testament for peace is irene, and it appears 92 times in the New Testament. It's one of its most common uses is in uh, greetings and salutations, uh, particularly in uh, the epistles. And it's very clear in the New Testament that peace is a key uh, Christian uh, principle. And one of the main, well, the main focus of this is the peace that is available in uh, Christ. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, the biblical perspective, in particular the New Testament perspective, on uh, war, peace, uh, non-resistance, and separation. Separation from the state. These uh, themes are all intertwined. Uh, but before we do that, I want to just say something about uh, the biblical view of time. So yesterday, we looked at this profound statement of God's uh, existence in time, found in Revelation 1 and verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is now, who was in the past, and who is to come, the Almighty. It's as if the text is saying that God fills time. God is eternal, as we saw uh, yesterday. There also is, in uh, the Bible as a whole, a very clear sense that time is unidirectional. Uh, it starts uh, with the beginning. So there you see the Greek word arche, which is beginning. And it flows towards a goal. So this is the Greek word telos, which is used in the New Testament. Both these words are found in, in the uh, Bible. And it's often translated as end, but end in the sense of the end justifies the means, right? So it's actually often better translated as goal, right? And so there's a passage in the book of Romans where Paul says that Christ is the goal at which the law or the Torah aims, right? So when you translate it as end, it, it doesn't quite give uh, the right meaning. So I want to stress this because the arrow of time has a goal. It, it's moving in a, a particular direction, and that goal is peace. That goal is the millennium. That goal is God being all in all, as we read in uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, however, uh, there will be, there has been, there will be uh, some dislocations and tumults uh, along the way. And the book of Revelation, chapter 16, of course, uh, presents us with the, the Battle of Armageddon. I'm uh, not exceptionally old, but I'm not exceptionally young. I've lived uh, several decades. I can't think of another time in the history of the Earth when uh, the nations have been more troubled uh, than they are now. And I lived through much of the Cold War and the, the specter of a, a nuclear exchange. Um, and I, I see this and hear this from uh, the students I teach in the university, uh, that they are really uh, very anxious. Uh, they don't see any certainty in the future. They're thinking about the environment, but they're also thinking about all the, the political uh, conflicts and uh, the military conflicts. Uh, we have a larger perspective, which is that a history goes uh, towards this 
uh, peace that the Bible talks about, both the Old and the New Testaments. Now, if we look at uh, Christian history, we can see that uh, a different view of time develops, and this comes partly, or even largely, uh, through the influence of uh, Platonism and other uh, Greek forms of philosophy. So in uh, the Bible, we have this very clear sense that there's a beginning, right, at, right, at, uh, right in the first chapter of the Bible, the book of Genesis, of course, we have the creation. So we have a beginning. Uh, history is moving towards the millennium and then ultimately God uh, being all in all. God's sovereignty will be uh, complete. So there is a singular notion of salvation, time, or history. Uh, we're on this uh, trajectory here. Whereas Augustine and other uh, early um, church uh, theologians uh, started to develop this idea that we have souls, and they sort of hop off this uh, arrow of time uh, into a realm of uh, timelessness. And this is heavily influenced uh, by, by Platonism. So this is why I'm calling it a, a dualist notion of salvation time. That you still have history in the material world, but then uh, the saints sort of hop off uh, that line. Well, this is not the biblical perspective. This is the biblical perspective here. And this relates to uh, our, our theme of peace. Now, you might say, well, it's kind of intuitive that time moves in an arrow. Well, in fact, this is not the case in all cultures. So, for example, in Hinduism, we have this idea of time uh, being a cycle. And this is true in terms of individuals in the reincarnation of birth and rebirth, but also in terms of the view of the cosmos, that the cosmos has this kind of cycle that it goes through. Uh, it's born, and then it's, it decays, and then it's, uh, it is uh, essentially destroyed in uh, a conflagration. And that's what this uh, statue of uh, Shiva, the Hindu god, um, is uh, pointing to. So if we compare Western, which is largely biblical uh, views of time, we see that in terms of the, the human, which I've called the microcosm, uh, we have resurrection, we have one life. Uh, there's a linear view of time also with the universe and uh, reality as a whole, whereas in Eastern traditions, we have this cyclical view. Yes, there are cycles in the Bible. We find this in the book of Ecclesiastes, but these are seasons, right? Day to day, those kind of cycles, and they are subordinated to, under this arrow of time. So this is a really interesting comparison because it shows us how uh, a worldview can even affect one's view of time, right? When we compare the Western, which is based on the biblical view of time, with uh, many Eastern uh, views of time. Now, I mentioned yesterday the, the Left Behind series and how it promotes this idea that there's going to be a rapture, that the, the saints are going to be lifted off the earth and, and go into heaven, and uh, some people who are not Christians are going to be left behind. So that's the meaning behind that uh, phrase. And there have been many iterations of it. This is one movie version of uh, that series of novels. And this uh, theology, or uh, teaching of the end, a teaching of uh, time, is very common in the evangelical community uh, in particular. Not all evangelicals hold this view, uh, but it is a very uh, common view. Where, where does this idea come from? Well, it comes in part from an interpretation of 2 Peter 3. So in 2 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9, we read, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So whatever this is saying, it's telling us that, that God's experience of time is different uh, than ours. It's obviously, he is uh, infinite uh, in terms of power and in terms of eternity. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach uh, repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be, now if you have a King James, or many other uh, English translations, the text then says, will be burned up. 
whereas the ESV and, and some other modern translations based on a different uh, a reading in the uh, Greek uh, have the word found. And this seems to be in the sense of uh, exposed to judgment. So that puts uh, a different meaning on this text. And then, of course, there is the issue of whether we take this literally or not. So for those uh, in the evangelical community who take this literally, they see this as speaking to the destruction of the earth and maybe even uh, the universe, and then it's replaced uh, with something else. This is clearly not uh, the biblical uh, view. But that's, that's, uh, that's the, uh, the source of it. It's not the text itself, but an interpretation of that text. Now, this language of uh, the heavens is probably allegorical. It's probably referring to uh, the political heavens. It's probably referring to the political systems uh, of uh, nations. And we don't have time to go into this, but there is uh, some biblical evidence for that. Now, Peter goes on to say, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hasting the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to this new, his new promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Even if there is a literal element to this text, Peter has also referred to uh, the flood of Noah. And of course, that was not the destruction of the globe. Uh, that, was, that involved some dislocations on the surface of the globe and affected uh, humanity, it affected the systems of things as they existed, but then there was a, a renewal. So if we follow that analogy, then clearly we would not conclude that this text is talking about the destruction of the earth. Okay, so um, that's just um, a little bit of background on the biblical view of time, and it relates to uh, what we're going to talk about for the rest of our presentation, which is that time is moving towards uh, perfect peace, and this will be uh, when the Prince of Peace uh, returns. I want to uh, take you to Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, this is a very important passage uh, in the Bible, and give you some sense of the impact of this passage uh, even in the secular world. So Isaiah 2 We'll start at verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So, roughly seven centuries before the time of Christ, we have this vision of world peace. And scholars and, and others, uh, including people who are not uh, uh, Christian, uh, often point to this passage as uh, the earliest uh, expression of this idea of universal peace. Uh, Micah uh, 4 and 3 has essentially the same language. And, Joel has it the other way around. When you're turning uh, agricultural implements into uh, instruments of war, uh, for a time of war. So this idea has um, permeated uh, various different cultures around the world, including uh, the former Soviet Union. So this is a statue that the Soviet Union uh, donated to the United Nations. It's in uh, New York City. And it shows a very muscular man beating a sword into uh, a plow. And then nearby there is this inscription, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So 
Such is the power of this vision that even an officially atheist society like the former Soviet Union uh, saw the, um, uh, the vision and uh, presented this uh, statue, and then there is this other inscription uh, nearby. Uh, this is an interesting um, model of a plowshare, and it's made out of a, uh, a decommissioned uh, nuclear weapon. And it was donated to the uh, atomic, uh, International Atomic uh, uh, Agency by uh, the Republic of South Africa. So again, it's picking up on this uh, biblical language. Uh, this is uh, a university in uh, North Carolina. Uh, it's a bell tower, which also has the words from Isaiah 2, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares. This is a monument. Uh, in uh, Jerusalem, in, in Israel. So this is what the text is about, right? It's pointing to uh, Zion. So this is near uh, Mount Zion in, uh, in, in Jerusalem, in modern Israel. And it shows some, um, it shows some uh, metal from uh, military hardware that has been uh, created into a kind of a, a plow-like uh, image. And there is an inscription that refers to uh, that passage. This is also in Jerusalem. This is a stained glass window installation at the National Library of Israel, and it has the text, um, come let us go up to the house of the Lord. It has the text from Isaiah 2, and on this side it has uh, bullets uh, that are being transformed into uh, shovels. So, slight adjustment, uh, but a very similar uh, metaphor. So, this uh, language in Isaiah 2, and Obviously, we link it with uh, such thoughts as praying for the, the peace of Jerusalem. We see now how uh, the city of Jerusalem and even many secular people uh, recognize just how important it is uh, to world peace. And it's just remarkable that we see this language um, so many uh, centuries ago. And then, of course, there's also the dove symbol, which comes from the story of Noah's flood. Uh, which is used as a symbol of peace. This is a Picasso uh, a drawing of the dove, and this is a UN uh, flag. And here we have another United Nations symbol showing the dove, and often the dove has the, uh, the olive branch as well. Uh, the environmental organization uh, Greenpeace also uses the, the dove and uh, the, uh, the rainbow from uh, Noah's flood as a symbol for uh, their environmental uh, action, etc. So these are images that come from the Bible and they're picked up by people who are largely secular. They recognize the power of them. Uh, for those of us who are believers in the Bible, uh, these imagery, this imagery has even more power uh, to us. All right, just a few thoughts on Christianity, the history of Christianity and uh, pacifism. It's a matter of historical record that many of the earliest post-New Testament Christians refused to serve in the military. This was the position of Tertullian and Origen, for example. Serving as a soldier was seen as incompatible with the gospel in at least two ways. War is violence, and militaries are an arm of the state. However, the thinking changed when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. The state then was Christian, or nominally so, and uh, at least um, uh, this was the view of, of many of the church leaders of the time, and this uh, led to a, a change in thinking. And there is a shift, uh, in a sense, back to more sort of Old Testament thinking. Now, one of the big differences between the New Testament and the Old Testament is the Old Testament, particularly the Mosaic Law, is a law for uh, religious purposes, but it's also a law for a nation with a territory, right, in, in Israel. And the New Testament doesn't have that. The Christianity is not a nation with a territory. Um, and so in Old Testament times, uh, there was open revelation from God, and there were uh, commands from God uh, to engage in military conflict. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, we don't have that because uh, Christians are not aligned with the state. Right? That's the New Testament ideal. That is the biblical ideal. 
Uh, that has not been followed, of course, by the majority of Christians because the thought was once the state becomes Christian, then that separation doesn't exist anymore and we come back into kind of an Old Testament uh, scenario. But this is a turn against the original character of the New Testament, which advocated separation from the state. However, in the early modern period, there were some groups in what is called the uh, Radical Reformation. The Radical Reformation, so this included uh, Mennonites, uh, the Polish Brethren. The Polish Brethren had views that are very similar to the Christadelphians. Uh, they believed in believers' baptisms, for example. They did not believe in the Trinity, did not believe in the immortality of the soul. Uh, they took stands against war and violence, and this is true of some Mennonites and the Amish uh, to this day. So to use modern expressions, they adopted pacifism and non-resistance. Now, as I think almost everyone in this room, if not everyone knows, uh, pacifism or non-resistance, uh, separation from the state, and non-participation in war, our conscientious objection uh, to war, is a defining uh, part of the emergence of our community. Uh, so this was true even before our community had a name. Uh, in 1865, the, near the end of the uh, U.S. Civil War, uh, of course, uh, John Thomas and some other uh, brethren in, in our community uh, went to register for a conscience objection and were told, you can do that, but you have to have a name. And so they came up with Brethren in Christ, which comes from Colossians 1, verse 2. And the authorities said, we need a single word, right? And so that's where we get Christadelphian, which is a rough Greek uh, equivalent. So our name is associated with uh, our stance on uh, war, non-resistance, and separation uh, from uh, the state. Uh, the stance, of course, is only possible in a, a community uh, as small as ours. So these are the three related uh, concepts. Now, I'm using the term pacifism, and I recognize that uh, in our community, we don't always use that term. And so there's a thought that technically we're not pacifists. I'll say something about that in a few moments. But uh, since pacifism literally means peacemaking, uh, I believe that uh, we can uh, take this um, as a description of our position with various qualifications, non-resistance and separation from the state. Some of you may have encountered this uh, statement from Bertrand Russell. So Bertrand Russell was uh, an ob objector to military service in World War I, and he was interned and actually met some Christadelphians uh, in these camps, and so got to know a little bit about our beliefs. And this is what he said, Christianity was in its earliest days entirely unpolitical. The best representatives of the primitive tradition in our time are the Christadelphians who believe the end of the world to be imminent and refuse to have any part or lot in secular affairs. As the number of Christians increased and the church grew more powerful, it was inevitable that a desire to influence the state should grow up. So he's encapsulating what I've already said. There is a shift once uh, the church uh, becomes the state uh, this idea of separation is gone, and with it, uh, the idea of non-participation in military uh, service. Uh, here's another scholar who was writing uh, in 1945 at the end of World War II. If we are to obey in detail the injunctions that were given to the first Christians, we must put ourselves in the same position as the first Christians and regard ourselves as a small band of believers living in a world that as a whole has not accepted Christ, following the path of separation and taking no responsibility for the affairs of this world. Our pacifism, then, will be merely incidental to a much higher renunciation of privileges and responsibilities. This is, in, this is the line actually followed by some of the smaller Christian sects, such as the Christadelphians and the Plymouth Brethren, and in a rather different form by religious communities like the Hutterian Brothers, the Hutterites. One cannot but respect their sincerity and consistency Personally, I feel little doubt that their attitude is much closer to the attitude of the earliest Christians than that of the larger religious communities, uh, bodies. But there is another side to it, so here's his criticism, and the austerity with which they leave the rest of the world to its fate will repel some of us more than their undoubted virtues will attract. So it's interesting, there's this honesty about uh, what um, uh, the earliest Christians uh, believed uh, and this uh, separation from uh, warfare and the state. 
Okay, let's just come back just for a minute or two to this definition, uh, to definitions of pacifism. Uh, Peter Brock, who uh, made a career studying uh, pacifism, particularly amongst uh, the descendants of the Radical Reformation, the Mennonite community, for example, uh, 1972 in his book, Pacifism in Europe to 1914, identified six categories of pacifism, vocational, soteriological, eschatological, separational, integrational, and goal-directed. Uh, so what is vocational? This is adopted by certain priests in certain religions, uh, or saying that one's artistic vocation, et cetera, takes precedence over fighting in war. Uh, soteri soteriological, and this just means salvation-oriented, an objection to shedding human blood because it leads to ritual impurity and thus to the loss of personal salvation, at least until some form of purification is undergone. Eschatological is a kind of non-violent interim ethic. In practice, like non-eschatological forms of pacifism, uh, so it's the same, so long as there is no eschatological event. So what is this? Eschatology refers to the time of the end. So the idea here is that eschatological pacifists are pacifists unless they're called on by God to fight. So many would argue that that is uh, the view, uh, or at least a major part of the view of the Christadelphian community. Uh, separational is representing the typical position of the sectarian pacifists and is best exemplified in the non-resistance doctrines held successively by Czech brethren, Anabaptists, Swiss, German, Dutch, and Polish, and Mennonites. And there's an element of that, I think, in our view as well. Integrational, using the peace ethic as an impulse in reformist movements, active in the political sphere, so that's different from our perspective. And then goal-directed is the six, uh, closely linked with the integrational type. It posits as a moral principle the consistent employment of nonviolent techniques to achieve desired political or social goals on the grounds that at least in the long run, these techniques are practically more effective than or more ethically superior to violence. We can see that some of these elements apply to our view, uh, but not all of them. So in other words, pacifism means different things uh, to different people. But I think we can embrace this term with certain qualifications. As I said, the word means peacemaker, and that is something that we are commanded uh, to be in our daily lives. Whatever happens at the return of Christ, even if we are interim pacifists, as Peter Brock uh, terms it, we are pacifists now, and of course, we are goal-directed. We are um, oriented towards the peace in uh, the coming uh, uh, kingdom. And uh, we have lots of publications in our community that talk about uh, our stand uh, from a historical perspective. And this book, Test Taste for Canada, about a brother, Evans, in uh, World War I, who suffered quite a bit uh, for his stand in not uh, serving uh, during uh, World War I. Uh, this is a picture of some young men in a, a, a work camp in World War II. And that young man right there is Charlie Dayton, who is my great uncle, passed away in 2016, almost reached 100. And this was a, a very interesting moment for our community because a lot of uh, these young brethren had come from different parts of Canada. Similar things, of course, happened in the United States and in Britain and other parts of the English-speaking world and uh, new uh, bonds uh, were formed and, uh, and so on. So again, it's a defining part of our uh, community. I want to just say a few brief things about <clears throat> peace in uh, the Bible. This expression, peacemaker, we, we probably most readily identify it with the Beatitudes. So here we see it in Matthew 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. So there's a blessing associated with being a peacemaker. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Romans 12 says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So that's an injunction uh, for us. It's a way of living. So we are uh, to be peaceful uh, with those in our community and those without. Uh, so that... I've called Don't Escalate, and we have two examples here uh, under the heading of de-escalation, and a soft answer turns away wrath from Proverbs 15, verse 1, 
and of course also from Matthew 5, a turn uh, the other uh, cheek. Uh, this, by the way, does not mean that we asked uh, to be uh, slapped, but it is a form of non-resistance which uh, can lead to de-escalation. One of the most important verses in the entire Bible that speaks to our position on peace and separation is found uh, in John uh, 18, <clears throat> verse 36, where Jesus before Pilate says, uh, my kingdom is not of this world, else would my servants fight, but my kingdom is not now from hence. Uh, and, and that is a guiding principle for uh, a, a New Testament uh, Christianity. And so he says essentially two things, and they're both related, that we're not part of this system of things, um, and we don't fight, right? Now, is this an interim ethic? Many in our community uh, take that to be the case, uh, but certainly it applies now. Um, I want to just uh, flag uh, another issue which I think is important. Uh, often when we discuss the Bible with uh, people who are maybe not very familiar with it or who have stereotyped uh, views about the Bible, uh, there is this thought that the Old Testament is highly militaristic. Uh, we have lots of descriptions of battles, and we have descriptions of the Israelites coming into the Promised Land uh, during the conquest under Joshua and uh, during uh, the time of the Judges, and even later during the time of uh, the Kings. And it's very true that there is a lot of military conflict in uh, the Old Testament. Um, and one of the reasons for this is something that I explained uh, when I was presenting on the topic of race and racism to the young people on Friday night. Uh, Israel is in this very unique geographical location on uh, the globe, uh, which is uh, this land bridge between Africa, Asia, and Europe. And that goes a long way to explaining why there's been so much conflict uh, in that area, uh, both in terms of capturing that territory, but also armies moving through that area, north or south, uh, on their way to uh, other uh, conflicts. But at the same time, the Old Testament is not all about taking up arms to fight. There are elements of pacism, pacifism even in the Old Testament. Or to put another way, uh, the Old Testament isn't, isn't as militaristic as some uh, assume. So let me just offer some thoughts uh, to ponder. Uh, one of the first things we can say is that the zone of war uh, was limited to the promised land, right? That is very specific. There's a geographical uh, a limit to uh, this zone of war. But we also see uh, in the Old Testament several critiques of military power, right? So this would be odd if the Bible was uniformly pro-military. Uh, and this includes the critique of the use of iron chariots. We find this in Joshua 17 and Judges 1 and Je Judges uh, 4. So some of the Canaanites who had iron chariots, this probably means, by the way, uh, that these chariots had uh, wheels on them with um, uh, iron, iron treads, which made them superior to other, uh, to other uh, chariots. And this gave them an advantage, a military advantage, uh, which uh, these, uh, these nations, often their city-states, could use to impose their political will on other people, right? So this is the way the arms race uh, works today, right? The nation with the most powerful weapons often gets to uh, call the shots, as it were. Uh, there are prohibitions in the Bible against amassing military hardware, uh, including uh, their prohibition against uh, amassing horses. Now, this was contravened. It was contravened under Solomon, for example. Um, and so the emphasis is on trusting in uh, the Lord, of course, and not relying on the strength of horses. So that narrative exists. Uh, by the time of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is actively appealing to the Judahites not to fight, uh, not to uh, fight against the, the Babylonians, uh, but to uh, practice what, in effect, is non-resistance. And then uh, something else to think about is we have some interesting examples in the Old Testament where very powerful military men are being uh, depowered. Uh, so Yael, uh, the woman who 
uh, slays the Canaanite general uh, Sisera, uh, a left-handed man, possibly meaning he did not have a right arm. Um, Ehud uh, slew Eglon in a very dramatic scene uh, in the Old Testament. A woman killed Abimelech with a millstone. Remember, he asked his armor bearer to slay him with a sword, lest it be said that a woman killed him, but it was no use. David later refers to his death and said a woman killed him. And then, of course, David himself, a boy, um, or at least a young, untrained man, uh, with no military uh, equipment, uh, just a sling and a stone, uh, uh, kills uh, Goliath, this giant of a man who had uh, all the military equipment. So there is this narrative that you find in the Bible that is directed uh, against militarism and uh, towards peace. Okay, um, just a couple other thoughts as we begin to wind down. We believe in being separated from uh, the political systems of our day. And part of the fr our freedom in Christ is freedom from the divisiveness of politics. We, of course, know that we have a lot of things, um, potentially, that we can divide over. Uh, so the um, sensible thing and the biblical thing to do is to leave politics and even informal political biases out of our community. And in so doing, we also avoid hypocrisy. And if uh, any of our young people are called up to a military tribunal, it turns out that there are witnesses who said, oh, so-and-so was ragging on a particular politician or whatever, then uh, we can uh, be accused of double standards. So we need to maintain political neutra neutrality. Even while we stand for the Gospels, we can be peacemakers, as Matthew 5.9. Um, enjoins us to do and be all things to all uh, people. And there is a very powerful statement in 1 Peter 2 and 17 to this effect. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Does anyone happen to know who the Roman emperor was when Peter wrote those words. Peter says, honor the emperor. And it was Nero who persecuted Christians and was morally a terrible man, right? So this is a, a radical stance uh, to take, this uh, political neutrality. Uh, and it's very hard to take this, uh, this stance. Um, it's very easy when you're listening to news to say, oh, that politician is crazy, and why did they do that, and ah, oh, my taxes, you know. Uh, but we have to try to maintain this uh, political neutrality. So while the biblical world calls for religious, moral, and political, uh, the biblical worldview calls for the uh, religious, moral, and political separation from secular society, uh, the biblical worldview uh, should not be hidden under a bushel. Instead, the Bible calls for believers to be a light to the nations, bringing the hopeful message of the gospel, the things of the kingdom and the name of Jesus Christ to all people, along with this love, justice, and peace through our words and actions. And the Apostle Paul uh, enjoins us to let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. So that's uh, at the core of this peace that uh, we can experience as uh, believers in uh, the Bible. And of course, uh, Christ himself said, uh, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let your heart not be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's from John 14 and 27. Jesus, of course, uh, in the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 9 is described as the Prince of Peace. So the Bible tells us that in God's plan, the trajectory of history moves inexorably towards peace. Right? This is the timeline. We're not in a time of peace now, but this is the goal of uh, uh, history uh, under God's uh, sovereignty. And we see these wonderful passages in Numbers, Isaiah, and Habakkuk but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory 
of the Lord. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea in the third of those uh, passages from Habakkuk. Okay, so just a quick summary. Um, we have looked uh, thus far at uh, biblical theism, the, the belief in the oneness of God, the belief that the world is creation. Uh, shortly in our exhortation, we are going to look at the theme of love. Uh, we have yesterday talked about uh, justice, how God wants justice to prevail now and in the future, and we have just considered how we ought to be peacemakers and live peaceful lives and that God will bring peace on the earth. The Apostle Paul says, be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. So now go out and bring light to the world.